You know, when you're the child of an alcoholic, you don't know if, if the electricity is going to be on or off. Uh, I mean, did he pay the utilities or did he decide to spend that money and get drunk? And, you know, a lot of kids turn to drinking or drugs. Fortunately, that's when I found the Lord. That's when I found Jesus Christ, which gave me a real centering in my life. We're going to stand up and say, no, no, you're not going to change history. You're not going to change science. You're not going to change biology. We stand for what we believe. Uh, and we got God on our side and we're just going to keep moving. The majority of Americans agree with you, your prescriptions in the book, not just problems that you lay out, you lay out the solutions and we'll get into that as well. But the silent majority of Americans agrees with these common sense prescriptions that you lay out and we've got issues. Why aren't people speaking out? Is social media and the pile on there the major reason? I think it is. Um, we cite some research in here that the percentage of people that are reluctant to express their opinions has tripled since 1950. In 75 years, the number of people that don't wanna speak out and say, here's how I feel about this issue has tripled. People are just saying, you know, I'd rather not say anything because if I say something wrong, if I choose the wrong word, if I say the wrong thing, then I'm gonna be attacked and I'm gonna be canceled. Cancel culture. And, you know, it was interesting. I talk in the book about George Orwell's 1984. And there, they if somebody ran afoul of, of the government, um, they were unpersoned. Right. Now it's called cancel. But back mm -hmm. then, and how prophetic was that book? He, he wrote that in 1948. That's right. And here we are. And so many of the things that he talked about are actually coming true now where if they catch you with the wrong word in your mouth, and some of these change so fast, you gotta get a weekly glossary update to know what's okay and, and what's not okay. And people's lives are being ruined over this. They're calling their jobs. Yeah. Uh, we've had more professors disciplined, suspended, or fired from universities than we have seen since the McCarthy era because our students are going in and saying, well, they use this word or that word, or they ask me to do an assignment that is contrary to uh, my political beliefs and that upset me. Um, so I'm complaining about that. Uh, I'm, I feel assaulted by the language. Yeah. Um, and I felt like there was a microaggression uh, being <laughs> used against me. I was in Israel recently and many Israelis came up to me and said, God bless Dr. Phil. For, for what you said. It's it's Dr. Phil unshackled now, in a sense, with Merritt Street. One of the strains running through this protest, I think, and you unpack this in the book, We've Got Issues, is the social justice movement, I guess you would say, but they, they pick a certain topic and they key on it and they demonize people who they don't agree with. You call it a victimization culture. Talk more about that. Well, they, they are what I refer to as social justice warriors. Um, which often, if they're at universities or whatever, it's not their job. Uh, their job is to teach economics or history or whatever, but they decide their own agenda. So you're getting an education that you didn't choose or pay for. Uh, but everything is, among a, a certain portion of America, everything is seen as is, is a dichotomy, the oppressor and the oppressed. And if you are successful, in any way, you're an oppressor. And if you're less successful, you're oppressed. And, and so you're a victim. And let me tell you, there is no time that a government is ever going to entitle you to self-worth, entitle you to self-esteem, entitle you to competency. And I think when parents do this with their children, I think when the government does it with their citizenry, uh, you cheat individuals out of the opportunity to, opportunity to observe themselves overcoming challenges and obstacles. And that's how we learn about ourselves. Yeah. We watch ourselves. I mean, take a five-year-old child that's going to kindergarten and they pull up in that circle drive, they get out of the car, walk up to that big metal door and grab that handle, pull it open by themselves and walk in there and go to that half-day kindergarten and then walk back out at the end of the day 
they observed themselves doing that. They said, I did. I got out of that car and I walked up that sidewalk by myself. It's a big accomplishment. And I'll never forget my mother. This was back in, oh gosh, I remember it like it was yesterday, but this had to be back in like 1970. She was living next door to some folks that had a little girl about five years old. And my mother was out in the yard and this girl came up and said, I can zip button and tie. <laughs> and my mother said, excuse me? She said, I can zip button and tie. And she said, oh, really? You can. She said, that's right. I can zip my coat. I can button my sleeves and I can tie my shoes. <laughs> and she said, well, show me. And she did. And she came in and told me that, that this little girl was so proud that she had mastered those tasks yeah. as opposed to a mother that did all that for the child until they were nine or 10. Yeah. And just that little simple thing, you can extrapolate that on throughout life. Every time a child masters a new technique, a new talent, yeah. a new skill, they say, it's like that little girl saying, I can zip button and tie. Yeah. It's like saying, I can do algebra, I, 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 can, I, I can get a job, I can live on my own. I can do all of those things are cheated from a, a child or a young adult when a parent or the government takes that away from them by doing it for them. Yes, yeah, strengthen through adversity and challenges. And, and personally, I think that we learn more from our failures than we do our successes many times. Of course times. we do. And, and you know, you haven't failed uh, or lost. Uh, you know this from sports. I always say, I've never lost a game. They just quit while we were behind. They <laughs> <laughs> just kept going. We I like up. that. I should have used that. <laughs> so, you know, you, we really have to get back to a meritocracy and say, you know, give people a track to run on, but let them run. Yeah. Tell us about your upbringing and how it shaped the concepts you lay out in the book. Well, you know, I grew up in Texas and Oklahoma and, um, I had three sisters, and um, uh, unfortunately, uh, my father uh, succumbed to alcoholism and was a, 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 I don't know if he was a good alcoholic, but he was a bad alcoholic. Um, and oftentimes it was pretty violent and, and chaotic. And, um, you know, when you're the child of an alcoholic, um, you become very, self-dependent because uh, you can't count on, you know, I, I, you, one of the things you don't ever do when, when you have an alcoholic in the home, particularly the father, you don't ever bring kids home with you. You know, you don't you know, leave schools. Hey, y'all come over to my house and we'll play out in the backyard or whatever. Uh, you don't ever do that. It's and, too um, unpredictable. It's unpredictable. You don't know if, if the electricity is going to be on or off. Uh, I mean, did he pay the utilities or did he decide to spend that money and get drunk? Um, I remember one night we were living in Denver and, um, we just been out kind of roaming around and it was getting pretty cold. We actually were pretty close to my house and five or six of my buddies said, let's go to your house and warm up. And I'm like, okay, take a shot, <laughs> you know, let's take a shot. Let's go to my house. So we can walk it up and I, I, and it was pretty windy and I, I see that something is blown off and is blocking the driveway. And I, I think, well, I have to get that out of the way. Well, I get up there and it's my dad. Uh, he's gone to bed, got hot, got up. It's like 20 degrees out. He got his pillow and came out and laid down in the driveway and he's asleep in the driveway. And you think, oh, you know, uh, what are you going to do here? And you got to get him up. He's going to freeze to death out there. And all your friends are like, uh, look, we probably better go, you know, and it's, and it's, it's that kind of thing. So you get to where you're, you know, very self-sufficient and, and, uh, you start looking for, you know, how can I make sense out of all this? And, you know, a lot of kids turn to drinking or drugs. Fortunately, that's when I found the Lord. That's when I found Jesus Christ which gave me a real centering in my life. Um, and you broke those family patterns. Yeah, at a time that I really needed it. Yeah. And um, I had two sisters, uh, two older sisters. Um, one of them got married when she was 14. The other one when she was, I think, at 15. Um, it was just chaos. It was just, yeah. I went in and out of the bedroom window instead of going through the house. Uh, I had a paper route at four in the morning. I would get up and throw that and then, 
Uh, I usually you'd throw that and come back and go to bed until time to go to school. I, I didn't do that. I went to the donut shop back door and sh I gave her paper. She gave me donuts and <laughs> and uh, I'd do anything to stay away from uh, of home. And um, and that's that's as I say, that's when I, I found my way uh, to the Lord. And it brought some peace in my life. It brought some order and sense to my life. And I I, I will say uh, that. My father died younger than I am uh, of a heart problem. In the last two years of his life, he got completely sober wow. and enrolled in the Dallas Theological Seminary and got his Master's of Divinity uh, in the last two years of his life. So came full circle back around. So How did he do it? How did he break <clears throat> free from that and, and you reform know, he, his life? He just really decided, I, I think that you know, he was having health problems and he was struggling with that. And he thought, you know what? Um, I, I need to require more of myself and I don't know how much longer I'm going to be here. I want to make the most of it and decided to do that. And he was teaching a Sunday school class uh, at his church uh, in Dallas and, and they let him teach this Sunday school class. And the first day, the first Sunday, I think he had three or five people in Sunday school class. And the day he died, he walked into a Sunday school class, put down his briefcase, opened it up, and fell over right there doing what he loved the most. And I think in attendance that day were over 300 people in his Sunday school class. Wow. It had grown that much because he was so authentic about yeah. the, the road he had traveled. Now, if your dad could do it, I mean, hey, lying in the driveway in 20 degree weather, passed out drunk, yeah. he turned it around completely. If he can do it, anyone can do it. That's what I think. And, and he was the an amazing athlete. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what's really gave him the drive to do it and and you know find his way to the Lord and and turn him around. And we had some wonderful times before we lost, and we, we lost him. I remember. When they told him, we knew ahead of time his heart was failing. And yeah. uh, he was a character. I, he went to the doctor that day, came home, and I said, Well, how'd it go? He said, Well, don't buy me any green bananas. <laughs> <laughs> he he kind of made a joke of it, but he, he, is, he was at peace. Doc, I'm so glad you shared that. I think a lot of our viewers may not have known that. They've always just thought, Well, Dr. Phil's always been Dr. Phil. <laughs> yeah, but no. hey, there's humble beginnings and a backstory here. You had to work yeah. your tail off to get to where you are right now. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I was living on the street when I was fourteen, uh, you know, because I was with my dad and uh, just the two of us, and he wasn't uh, he, he wasn't really able to do much, and yeah. so it just didn't work out well. But you know what? That's what I say. Everything I've ever done has prepared me for what I'm now doing. I I understand yeah. people from different walks of life. I've been there. Yeah. That had to shape, obviously, what you went on to do, the Dr. Phil show, and not cancel culture. In the book, you call it council culture. Did that kind of stir your passions, your upbringing for doing what you're doing now? You know, it, of course. And wouldn't it be nice if, if somebody said something wrong, something offensive to someone or whatever, that instead of saying, okay, got one, let's get on the internet and yeah. start ruining their life, if somebody just said, hey, can I get a minute with you? And pulled him to the side and say, listen, I, I don't run your life or whatever, but I want to tell you that what you said uh, was hurtful to me and maybe to a lot of other people. And uh, I'm, I'm going to trust that maybe your heart's not dark. Yeah. And I just wanted to tell you and do with it as you will. But I'm, I'm hoping maybe you'll think through it and come at this a different way. You know, counsel with them and say, look, I love you. I forgive you. I'm, I'm not going to attack you, but I just wanted to let you know and hope maybe you'll think about it the next time. Yeah. Wouldn't that be nice instead of calling their work and oh. trying to get them fired? Yeah. And is that possible now in this social media culture? Hey, social media is here to stay most likely. How can we navigate that? In the book, you lay out the algorithms. You talk about deprogramming. And you talk about the fact that today, people are mainly, it seems, on both sides shouting at each other and not trying to have the kind of rational conversation, respectful conversation that you just described. Well, there are, you know, I said there are 10 principles in the book. Uh, 
that I set out that I think are critical for a healthy society, a healthy culture. And two of them sound very simple, uh, which I'm really proud of because I think the best solutions are elegant. Yeah. They're very simple. And these two are really related. And one of them is work really hard to understand someone else's point of view. Work really hard to understand their point of view instead of just shutting them down. Too many of us have confirmation bias where all we want to see is something that confirms how we already feel. And in fact, the research says if you bring someone like that, evidence to the contrary, it deepens their resolve. It doesn't, you, you bring them data, it deepens, they dig their heels in even wow. more unless you make them aware of that tendency. But work really hard to understand somebody else's point of view. And I'll tell you how critical that is. The FBI, I work a lot with law enforcement. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I do training with law enforcement, talk about interrogation techniques, deception detection, getting to the truth. And in the, the courts in a former life as yeah, well, big yeah, time. Negotiating yeah. uh, with hostage takers, all, all kinds of things are so interesting to me. Yeah. And, and so I've done training with law enforcement before. And uh, the FBI trainers... Uh, will uh, negotiators will tell you that the best way to get hostages released alive is make sure that hostage taker knows that you understand why he did it to begin with. Wow. It, it's not about power. It's not about it, it, money. It's making sure that that hostage taker knows he gets why I did this to begin with whether it's political or domestic or whatever, if he knows, okay, this guy understands why I did this, that's your best shot at ever getting them out of there alive. Does that factor into, and you've done a bunch on school shootings, obviously, and talked about that in the book as well. Does that kind of factor in the desire to be seen and become infamous, I should say, with the school shooters? Yeah, it, it plays into desperation that people have. And if you're if you're talking to somebody and they feel heard, they, they feel like, hey, this person's heard me, they've seen me, they've heard me, um, then you don't feel so desperate anymore. And so that's one of the principles is work really hard to understand their point of view. You don't need to agree. I'm not saying agree with it. I'm saying just understand it where you could make their argument for them. And then the other one that's related to it is treat yourself and others with dignity and respect. And you go, well, that's pretty simple. No, I'll tell you the complex part of that is treating yourself with dignity and respect because yeah. that's not the easy part. It's are you treating yourself like you're your own best friend and treating yourself with dignity and respect is so important because you can't give away what you don't have. If you don't have dignity, you don't have respect, you can't give it to the other person. Your heart for young people is obvious throughout the book. But the levels of loneliness and depression, and that was exacerbated, I think, by the COVID lockdowns. And you've talked about that, including on The View, of all places. Uh, talk about the state of our young people today and this mental health crisis and, and how we can uh, overcome this. I did talk about it on The View because uh, I'll go anywhere and talk to anybody. Uh, I don't care how left or liberal or, or woke or whatever they are. Because that's what we need to do, right? We need to, it, you don't just want to preach to the choir. You want to go talk to the other side yes. of, of these things. So I'll go anywhere and debate anybody on uh, anything that I have knowledge of. Like, don't ask me to debate you about your 401k. I, I can't <laughs> add two and two and get five every time. So I'm the last guy to talk about that. But the things I know about, um, I, I talk about. And this book is so researched, you have no idea. I mean, I've got a brain room made up of college oh, yeah. professors. Uh, that, Meticulously footnoted. Oh, my gosh. Uh, that's why it took so long to write, because I wanted, it's triple checked. I wanted to make sure everything in there was up to the minute and yeah. accurate. And you poured your heart into this book. I did. And that's obvious on every page. You love America. You love this country. I do. I I. I I'm so glad I'm an American. I, I love this country. I, yeah. I, I stand up when the flag goes by. I put my hand over my heart when they play the, uh, the, the national anthem. And I'm, I'm proud to be an American. And 
Do we have problems? Of course we do. Uh, but that's just a to-do list. Mm -hmm. And if I got a hill to climb, I'd rather climb it in this country than any other on the globe. I'll tell you that much. Amen. Um, and I don't care if you start on third base, dugout, or dumpster. Wherever you start, this is the best place to, to start that climb. And we had a major, major event in our lives. COVID hits. They shut down the schools for two weeks. The curve. Yeah, take yeah. a break here. Right, right, you're right. Get our arms around this. I said, okay, I can get behind that. Then it was going to be two months. This started in March. They said, we're just going to do it through the end of the year. I said, mm, bad idea. Then they say, well, we're, we're not going to have summer school. We're not going to come back in the fall. I went on the air at that point and said, let me tell you people something. We'll be very clear here. Quarantining these children like this is going to create more damage than this virus ever will to these children. And people said I was some kind of crazy man, some kind of heretic. And, and, and let, me, let me point this out. The people who were keeping the records about the levels of mental illness among our young people are the same people that made the decision to shut down the schools, to take away the support system where these kids got social interaction, competition, educational attainment, all the things that made them able to keep going. They knew they were in a mental health crisis and they shut down the schools that kept them going. And you know what else happened? When you shut down the schools, you shut down the mandated reporters who are watching these kids looking for abuse, sexual molestation, all of those things that these kids live with at home. And when they shut the schools down, the referrals to DCFS and Child Protective Services dropped anywhere from 40 to 60 percent. Now, wow. do you think the abuse stopped? Went down 40 to 60 percent? Of it course not. Increased, I'm it sure. just We sent them home and abandoned them to their abusers behind locked doors. We abandoned these abused and molested children to their abusers and molesters and locked them up. And nobody talks about that. I'm talking about it, but nobody else wants to talk about it. And we sent them home and left them to those, those, those predators. And, uh, and, and these are the same people. And when you talk to them about it, they say, well, we did the now. best we did, we, the best we could with what we knew. No, you did not. You did not do the best you could with what you knew because you knew they were in a mental health crisis. You knew they needed that school for meals, for protection, and for the interaction that kept them growing and moving forward. And you shut it down anyway. And when you shut it down, you had no plan for reopening it. And now you have no plan for, sh for closing the academic gap. And we are 34th in math, we are 16th in science, and we are 9th in reading internationally. We are sliding down the hill. We will be feeling the effects of those COVID lockdowns for years and years to come, I fear. I don't know that this generation will close the gap. Somebody needs to be talking about this. And what I want people that are watching right now to decide is, am I delivering the right message? And am I the right messenger? And if the answer to those questions are yes, then I want them to support us on Merritt Street Media. I want them to learn what's in this book so they can become part of the support system for getting America back on track. In the time we have left, you stress faith, family, and freedom. I call them the three Fs. Uh, that is just a, a thread throughout the book. What are some more prescriptions from the good doctor, Dr. Phil, all is not lost. Hey, we've laid out some, some pretty heavy problems in I'm our the conversation. the incurable optimist. But cure, <laughs> incurable, and these problems are curable. They are. I'm the incurable optimist. I, I think that we have a tremendously bright future ahead of us, but we have to step up and claim it. We have to seize this, this, this future, and the way to do it is to protect our country. And you say I'm really active in in protecting young people. And you're right, because I love to give a voice to those who don't have one. And so many of these children uh, need somebody to step up and, and be there for them, to support them in their pursuits. Uh, let them go out and do what they need to do. Like I say, let them learn. You know, a, a child gets bullied a little bit. A child falls and scrapes their knee. A, a, a child has some failure along the way. That's okay. Now, if a child's getting brutally bullied at school, 
they shouldn't go through that alone. Sure. Parents should step up and help. But if, if somebody's leaving them out, didn't invite them to a party, you know, they'll get over it. Uh, you don't need to race in there like your hair is on fire and scoop them up. They're called helicopter parenting. Exactly. Concierge yeah. helicopter parenting. Yeah. You don't want to do that. You want to let them do as much as they can on their own. But I really believe that this 80% of the country that's in the middle, we just need to say uh, the number one prescription I have in the book is be who you are on purpose. Decide what you believe, what you value. I mean, consciously sit down and, and decide this, discuss it, and then live with intention. And when you do that, my, oh, my. Uh, I think some of these fringe activists have pushed too far and too hard, and they've awakened people like me and everybody that's listening to me. They've awakened us, and we're going to stand up and say, no, no, you're not going to change history. You're not going to change science. You're not going to change biology. We stand for what we believe. Uh, and we got God on our side and we're just going to keep moving.